I'm Craig Nippenberg. Uh, our topic today is I was a turtle when you don't make a pleasure connection with reading, uh, which I'll just basically tell my story. Typically, I, when I do lectures, I talk about the kids I work with, strategies to help them. This time, I'm kind of just going with my own experiences and then gleaning um, understanding of emotions for dyslexic students and kids and adults and then sort of gleaning strategies out of that. So it's a little bit of a different lecture than I've done before. We just did a new PowerPoint for it, and I liked it a lot. I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, just a way of introduction, I come at the topic from three different perspectives. Uh, professionally, I've been working for, it'll be 35 years this summer with kids. Uh, we specialize at my private practice with running social skills groups for kids, social and emotional development groups. Majority of our population are exceptional students, so dyslexia, ADHD, Asperger's, uh, or autism spectrum disorders, um, anxiety disorders. So we see a breadth of kids, but we specialize in groups. Uh, one of the brochures is there. Um, I also am the consultant at St. Anne's Episcopal. Our principal was here at the first talk, and so I had fun talking about St. Anne's. I'll mention some experiences there. I also was on the board of directors here at Denver Academy for nine years. I turned limited. Nine years is the max you can do, and I just stepped off about a year and a half ago, right before things just exploded with uh, Mark T and the school enrollments up. And so I stepped off right as it was exploding. But uh, that was, was a dear pleasure. I also, so professionally, I come at the topic from that perspective. Uh, as a parent, uh, my son, who I'll talk about, he's, he's got a touch of me in him. Uh, talk about some of his experiences. And then my wife and I adopted a little uh, seven-year-old girl at the time, uh, Lily, who's nine now. And I'll talk to you about her and her reading struggles and also um, the attentional issues. So I know all about the brain damage of trying to get homework done with exceptional kids because we're doing that every day. And I'll tell you about Sunday night towards the end and what I, bro result what I resorted to this past Sunday to get the homework finished. So I definitely have the parenting experience. I'm going to go ahead and close the door. And then I come at it from a personal sp perspective. So I am dyslexic, and I will tell you my story, and that's what we'll be focusing on. And I intimately know the emotions and struggles of dyslexic students, and we'll look at how those affected me. I have a couple beginning points I like to think about as we start. First of all, I like to tell all parents, whether I'm lecturing on ADHD, dyslexia, autism, is I'd say we don't have um, dyslexic kids. We have kids with dyslexia. And any time a diagnosis of a child becomes the primary filter you see them with, you're really in trouble with that kid. How many of you are teachers? Uh, parents? And both? Okay. Uh, so you really want to see them as a kid first, and we'll talk about fundamental drives for kids. What is it they want to be able to show you and do that is fundamental to their nature? The disability or the difficulty is second, and that always has to be secondary, not the primary thing. Uh, second beginning point is the importance of coordination. Uh, so for those of you in the schools, coordination with all the teachers, right? The specialist teachers, the PE teacher, uh, coordination with substitutes. I had a little girl about 15 years ago who the mother, uh, she was a Cherry Creek student. Mother had an IEP set up for Carrie Ann. She had uh, dyslexia. And part of her IEP is that the teacher wouldn't use the dreaded red pen. Okay? Great accommodation for her. Until one day, the substitute was there. And Carrie Ann came home crying with her paper full of red circles. Nobody bothered to tell the substitute, right? Now, does that happen fairly often in schools? Yeah, you bet. there's lots of moving parts when you, when you throw in the specialist teachers and substitutes and everything. But you really try to coordinate that. Coordinating with the parents is really essential too. And for those of you, uh, if you're co-parenting a child, trying to be on the same page. I, I will tell you with my daughter, when we got her, we didn't know if she was dyslexic or not. She was uh, several years behind in her reading. We looked at DA. Uh, we decided we would try Most Precious Blood, which is right here in Colorado. And it's been a, she's a third grader now. It's been a great fit for her. And thanks to Jenny Earnwine, Philippe's wife, who's the uh, learning specialist at St. Anne's. She also was my daughter's tutor for about a year, year and a half. Thanks to her and my wife, our daughter made up two years of reading. And what it turned out, Dr. Wolf talked today about exposure to reading. Exposure, 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 exposure. And basically what we discovered is she didn't have dyslexia, but she never got re read to. So when she was preschool, 
there was limited reading uh, for her, so she never really got exposed to reading. Um, and so she's made up two years. Now, my wife is a 27-year retired school teacher with Jeffco Schools, so we thankfully have PARA, which is a wonderful program for any of you in the public schools. Um, she works, worked with her every day, still does, weekends, ILS. I can't remember. There's two different computer programs that she does with her, another one she does with her every weekend, you know, during the week. And there'd be times I'm like, honey, couldn't we just kind of take a break? You know, like, I don't know if I'd be doing that, you know, like, that's not my nature. When she went out of town once, I'm like, she told me everything I needed to do with Lily, and I'm like, couldn't we just play and not do any of that this weekend? Uh, but I do it because I know it pays off, and we've seen the results. And she'll say to me sometime, now that she's reading, and she's reading Harry Potter, and she has a book with her all the time, and she'll say to me, well, Daddy, you're, you're a little... A little more fun sometimes. And I'll say, I know, honey, but you, you know how you love reading right now? That wouldn't have happened without your mother. It wouldn't have happened with me. I, I would have not been pushing her to do those things. Oh, I left it on because I was calling you. I better turn off the, that's really fun. Can you stop the tape for a second? Uh, this is my son, everybody, Alex. Uh, I'm going to tell an Alex story next. So anyway, just coordinating with everybody else. Uh, third piece is to, to be thinking about the genetic component. Dr. Wolf touched on this some. Um, uh, a lot of uh, dyslexia is genetic related. Being dyslexic myself, when Alex was coming out of kindergarten, first grade, I thought we need to get him tested so we know what we've got and where he stands. His mother is a prolific reader, journalist, was an editor at the Denver Post, reads like nonstop. How many books does she have? Thousands? I mean, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> And we got him tested, and sure enough, he, he was in the middle between the two of us. And they said he has some red flags of you. And so we were able to get him in the reading lab at St. Anne's, where he really just cranked along and, and really got ready for high school and, and now college. And the apple didn't fall far from the tree because he was helping me make this presentation. And he said, well, you know, I got this big book to read tonight, like 300 pages. He said, but I've never, I haven't read a book yet in college. Now, he's got like a 3.9. He can do what I can do, which is just skim stuff. And I'll show you how I learned to do that. Um, and then he said, he looked at one of my slides about reading out loud, the fear of reading out loud in front of people. And he said, oh, in my Greek mythology class, the first day we had to put our names on three by five cards, and the professor pulls cards, and you have to stand up and read Greek mythology. And he's like, this stinks, right? Now his buddy, who is a bit of a slacker, you might say, uh, didn't show up for the first class. So he'll never have to do it because the teacher doesn't have a three by five card on him. So he like escapes. So the lesson is, don't go to the first class. Just skip the first class. Then you don't have to worry about that reading stuff. But there is a huge uh, genetic component to it. So moving along into our slide, when I lecture, I like to do brain-based stuff. I have a brain-based uh, social development curriculum at St. Anne's that I've now written into a book that I'm working on, uh, doing our second revision of it before hopefully getting it published. So I talk about the different aspects of your brain that helps you be a social person. Today I've just selected a couple of those to highlight the relationship between struggles, your emotions, your self messages, and then your behavior. And just in a real brief snapshot, so your emotions come from down here in your brain, uh, primarily your amygdala, which triggers anger and anxiety responses in us. That's a pretty primitive part of our brain. The, the brain as a species is developed bottom to top. So emotions, automatic brain first, thinking brain. Finally, this here, your frontal lobe, or what we call executive functioning skills. With the students at St. Anne's, I just call it the president. It's the president of your brain. It tells you what to do, when to do it, and it helps you control your emotions. So your president is your stop mechanism when you have an emotional experience. So. Uh, when that, my phone went off, I was like, spit. I had an emotion. My president kept me from blurting it out, right? I didn't blurt it out, and I thought, well, we are taping. I might as well say something funny um, to make uh, recover for the mistake, okay? Now, so the emotions are coming out. They're turned on. The president stops your immediate response, and it stops the emotions. It just says, wait. Let's stop. Let's think about this. If it can stop them, 
it kicks it down to a little part of your brain called the right, pre, the right prefrontal lobe occipital cortex. I call it the thinking feeling brain. And it's the place where you can think about your emotions and your past experiences and your past behaviors and how others are gonna feel. So in my case, I thought quickly about, that'd be pretty inappropriate if I yell out a swear word. I'm being taped right now. Really need to think about another way to handle this. Uh, have a little joke, right? That all came from that part of my brain. Now, I, I've done a lot of speaking over the last 30 years. If I was speaking for the first time, do you think that'd be a little harder to handle? You don't really have the experience to draw upon in your, in your brain. So today we're gonna to be looking primarily at reading and experiences I had, the emotions I had, then the messages I developed for myself and how that affected me. Does that make sense? So that's this part of the brain right here, right prefrontal occipital cortex, and it's this part of your brain actually tells your amygdala to stay on or off. So if you determine that this thing you're upset about really is valid and you need to do something about it, it will, it's, it will say stay on. Like, you, you, you gotta feel passionate. So if I'm upset at a sport and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be not too upset because then your president doesn't work so well, but I get more passionate and we got five minutes left in the game, that puppy's gonna keep me going to the end. It's gonna keep those, pa those passions high till the end of the game. Does that make sense? It also will tell them to turn off. So it's the part of the brain will tell your amygdala, it's okay, just turn off. You don't need to be that upset. It's not that big of a deal, okay? Now, as we go through this, you have to think about your child or the students in your class because they all have a unique makeup. Some kids have incredible presidents, usually girls. So if you do a test for it, girls are about the 80th percentile, presidential function. They have better self-control, they pay attention better. You go to any kindergarten classroom, what are most of the boys doing? We have one of our pre St. Anne's preschool teachers is here. What are the boys usually doing? Anything they, want. anything they want. There you go. They're doing anything they want, right? Uh, boys are about the 50th percentile. If you have a kid with ADHD, they're about the 10th percentile. So their stop mechanism does not work. The easiest, I love the basketball analogy. So your feelings is like the, the team on a fast break. You know, they stole the ball, they're coming down the court. The president is the defense, okay? And you're hoping you got a good defense to stop the emotions. For the ADHD kids, their emotions just generally come right out of them because they don't have much defense. And their emotions just score every time. So you, you gotta think about how's your kids president. You gotta think about how your kid is emotionally. I fortunately, I, what helped me survive with my dyslexia is that I have a very, I've always had a pretty good president. Um, I was, you know the marshmallow test? If you heard about to, to measure impulse control with the little preschoolers, um, I would have passed that. I would have waited 10 minutes and got the extra one. It was not that hard for me to, to, to control my impulses and my emotions. Emotionally, I'm sort of a Winnie the Pooh. I, I've always been pretty happy. I wake up happy. I've always been like, eh, it's no big deal. You know, Winnie the Pooh says when he gets upset, he just says, oh, bother, right? And I've sort of been that way. You've got some kids that might be a bit of a, a rabbit. Rabbit gets mad, he's always pissed, right? Uh, Eeyore gets really down and sad. You get the kid who's sad a lot. You get the kid who's like Piglet, they're very anxious. So they tend to have more emotions coming out of them, okay? Now in my formula as it relates to school, I had a pretty good president, I'm kind of a Winnie, so I don't get too upset about things emotionally. Um, I had good social processing, so the other third part of your social brain is your nonverbal abilities, ability to read people. That was always easy for me, so I, I had a lot of friends to depend on that I could rely on as I got through school. Uh, I have a very fast processing speed. I can process things pretty quick, which really helped, and I had a really good memory. So I basically was able to learn through whole, I, I do, I'm a whole word reader, that's how I learned to read. Now, whole word in the 60s came out of New Zealand, as I recall, and it was sweeping our country, and I, this was in St. Louis, Missouri in like 1960s, the 1960s is when I was in school, and it was the whole word curriculum. They weren't doing a lot of phonics. And I'm dyslexic, so I didn't, in addition to not being able to do phonics, I didn't get much help with it. We didn't have tutors. But because of my memory, I was able to memorize words. And I'll show how that played out later on. Uh, I'm also pretty good at picking up the gist of things. Like I can just pick out the meaning of what it's about. And, and that actually got developed 
as I, in relation to my dyslexia, be able to get quicker at seeing the meaning of things. But you're looking for the kids you're working with or your own child, sort of what's their unique makeup, which will help you decide how you're going to approach them. Uh, lifetime of messages, I'm going to do something real quick with you. I want you a little exercise where I want you to just take 30 seconds, see if you can think of a negative message you got in school, and maybe around reading or just school performance, where somebody, peer, teacher, whatever, said something that hurt your feelings, made you feel different, that was really a negative experience for you, okay? So just take like 20 seconds and see if you can think of something back from when you were a kid. Okay, now tuck that on one side. This time, think of a positive. See if you can think of a positive. Some, somebody said that just made you feel special and, and really proud of yourself. Uh, and it could be around your reading, your academic performance, social stuff, any of that. Uh, and take a couple seconds for that. And now just by show of hands, how many could remember a negative? Okay, how many are positive? That's pretty good. How, how many are your school teachers? Okay, the, when I, any, anytime I do this exercise, usually you get more negatives than positives. Guess where most of the negatives are from? School. When I have teachers in the audience, we have a lot more positives. And guess where the positives are from? School, right? You all love school. You were probably a great reader. So when you have a kid that's not a good reader, it's kind of foreign to you, right? It, it doesn't, wait a minute, I know how to read. How come you don't, right? It, it's, you had lots of positive at school. Most of the kids I see, they got a lot of negatives. But anybody want to share one just for, I'm going to share my positive and negative, but anybody want to share one just for demonstration points, either you're positive or negative? Anybody want to be brave and bold? Yes? Um, we were in the third grade of my teacher saying to me and another girl in my class, you guys are going to get the teachers at your high school graduation. Oh, so she was already predicting your future about how great it's going to be, right? Yeah, it was a he. Yeah. Oh, it was a he. Mm -hmm. He's like, look, you're looking ahead. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't tell you how many people I've had. I, was, I did an adult ADHD support group meeting, 20 adults with ADHD. All could remember negatives. Only one could remember positive. Mm -hmm. We had people remember being duct taped to the seat, duct tape on their mouth because they chatted too much, and several who said, the teacher who told me I could never go to college, I would never amount to anything. They got the negative predictors. Now think about the value that you got of that positive. Just must have been cataclysmic. Then if you think about if the teacher says, you're probably not going to make it to graduation. I don't think you're going to make it. Or you're really not college material. Right? Now that used to be a more common phrase when I was younger, and some of you can remember that. Now, Colleges have gotten so good at expanding to everyone and, and kids with learning issues that there's no reason that the majority of our kids can't go to college. Back then it was sort of, well, you're just not measuring up, right? Um, anybody else want to share one? The, the most common things you get um, for positives is feeling special in some way, like unique. The most common negative is feeling different. There's a big difference between different and unique, right? Uh, when you're different, that means you're not up to the level of the other children. Uh, being excluded is definitely a negative one for lots of people. Uh, again, feeling special or helpful is really good for kids. And, and you'll hear kids who will, you know, the teacher asked me to clean the board, right? Do kids still love to do that? Well, they love when the teacher asks them to do something special, right? It really makes them feel unique in that way. So now, for our special needs students, they're getting, when you're little, your primary caregivers are hopefully giving you good messages. Now this whole talk today is based on a reasonable early child life experience. More and more research is coming out when you look at kids who have been abused or neglected in poor environments, underserved environments, in adequate environments, it really affects their trajectory more than anything else. Okay, so we're taking kids who've had a reasonable early life experience, needs were met, parents loving figures who loved them and cared for them. Then you start getting messages from the other children, right? Teachers, whoever, pastors, the synagogue, rabbi, giving you messages, and then you're beginning to give yourself messages. Now in your case, when that teacher said that, you probably f had a self message, you felt great, and then your message, well, what do you think you thought to yourself about you? 
I'm smart. I can do it. I'm, I'm competent. Other people think I'm competent. Now, when you think about her experience, if she has that feeling and that self-message, I'm competent, what's that going to result in? Better performance. She's going to relish that class, that teacher, and she's going to work harder for that teacher. Our special needs kids, kids with ADHD, get 10 times the negatives from a teacher than other kids. Now, you just think about that. So, for every time I have to say, could you pay attention, please, honey? Okay? And I tell you 10 times, sit still, are you paying attention? Earth to, I can't see your name, Gary. Gary. Earth to Gary. Come on, Gary, you with us, buddy? Right? Sometimes you can get sarcastic. That happens to all of us. How's Gary going to be feeling over time? What is getting loaded into that little area of his brain? You have to think about what messages he's developing. For the parents of our special needs kids, they get 10 times, the ADHD parents get 10 times the phone calls from the teacher as other parents. So if you're a parent of a special needs kid, how are you feeling? Picked on, you're feeling constantly, they're coming at me, everybody's, the school's always calling. The word, I, I had an article years ago, I've since lost it, I sent it out to the teachers at St. Anne's every fall, and it was for teachers, and it was written for teachers that when you make the first phone call of the year, home about a problem kid, be ready for that parent being pissed. And don't take it personal, because the parent being angry is just their grief. So they spent all summer sending them to one of my social skills groups, and they've done tutoring, and they were so confident with the new medication that this year would be better, and then you make that phone call. As a parent, you're just crushed, right? So sometimes when you're crushed, who do you turn on? you kill the messenger, right? And you're, as a teacher, usually the messenger. You're the one to say, hey, we've got those problems again. Um, so you've just got to understand the emotions of our parents. Tourette syndrome parents have far more the calls to, uh, parents with Tourette syndrome kids, they, they have very obsessive behaviors. They often will tend to do a lot of picking, cutting. They have, uh, I think it's like 10 times the calls to social services. And they're not doing it. The kid is picking, but they go to school, somebody sees it, they call social services, police and the social worker come into your house. How do you feel? You don't feel so good as a parent at that point. You're, you're feeling pretty down, okay? So that's our messages. Isn't this thing cool? You just touch the board and it comes along. <laughs> Realms of control, a fundamental drive. And this is that beginning point about we don't have dyslexic kids. We have kids with dyslexia. Kids want to master their universe. They want to have control. They actually want you to be proud of them. They're looking for adult recognition and, and messages, positive messages about them. They want to be in control. Now, think about an infant. What's one of their first acts of control? When you're trying to feed them, what can they do sometimes? And spit it out, right? That three-year-old, you know, that terrible twos and threes, what do they want? control and when they don't get it, what do they do? They explode all over the place. Kids want to feel like they're mastering the world and getting positive strokes from the adults, okay? When you're not mastering it, one, you're getting more negative messages, but then you're forced in this position of, I need help, but do I really want help? I need it to get by, but in my heart of hearts, what do I want? To be in control. And if you're helping me, that means what? I'm not in control. There's something I'm not, I need to get help. I gotta, I gotta have the tutor, right? Have you ever had a kid go, I get to go to a tutor? I can't wait, right? I get to be in the reading lab? Oh boy, right? <laughs> now, it's especially that dynamic of needing help but not wanting it happens with the parents because that's where you really want to shine and separate from your parents. So if your parents are trying to help you with the homework and there's this visceral part of you that doesn't want the help, especially when you're in fourth or fifth grade and you're a guy in sixth grade, what's he gonna do with you? Argue and fuss and drive you nuts. I had a sixth grade boy the other day who does that every day and I said, John, I tell you what, I'm gonna tell your mother She's not going to edit your papers anymore because every morning she looks at his work, edits it, circles some things, gives it back some so he can self-correct it. Now, have you ever met an exceptional kid that said, oh, thanks for pointing out my mistakes. I'm going to correct those right away. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? He didn't want to do it. He blows up. 
So I said, I'll tell you what, John, I'll tell your mom to stop editing your work. And he looked at me and said, no, I need it. I'll fail if I don't. I'm like, you're a smart guy. You're a smart kid. So my job now with him and his mother is to figure out a different time and a different way to do it so that John feels more in control. So for one thing, he's going to have to ask. Instead of mom just doing it, he's going to ask. Okay? I tell the kids all the time, I said, look, I've got several uh, administrative assistants. I've got editors that, that do my stuff. But I ask them for help. They don't start doing it for me. They don't just do it. I have to ask them. I have to pay them. Your parents are doing it for free. I have to pay my assistants. But I'm, and when you ask, you're in control. Does that make sense? When it's coming at you all the time, and when you're an exceptional kid, you're always feeling like it's coming at me. Next slide. So this, this change. So if you think about um, teeter-totter, your parent control over here, as the kid gets older, is supposed to go to them. Because of their struggles, it tends to stay more on the parent side. And if it wasn't for the parents, that kid really would fail. But then you set up a dynamic where the parents are over-involved in the kid's life. And the one thing I would tell all of you as teachers and parents is to push independence as much as possible, just far enough that they won't hang themselves, OK? So you got to, they got to survive. They got to get by. But you want to push independence as much as possible. I said this at the first one, Alex. I stopped treating track of, and don't be texting during my talk, you pinhead. Um, sorry. <laughs> and he is my son. I can say that. Um, when he was in fourth grade, I stopped asking him what his homework was. I rarely knew. If I did bring up homework, I'd say something like, hey, you know, I'm hoping we can go to the Avs game tonight or watch the game on TV. Do you think you'll have your homework done? Now, what am I really asking? How much homework do you have, right? Which usually is the first word out of the parent's mouth when the kid comes home or in the car, right? Do you have any homework, right? Don't ever say that first. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't bring it up right away. Now with him, I, at fourth grade, I could do that. He was very independent. Uh, with our daughter, I don't know. She's third grade. I'm not sure she's going to be ready for that. She has some attentional issues. I don't know if she's going to be ready to just go on her own, right? If, if we still have to do quite a bit of monitoring to make sure things are getting taken care of and, or that the spelling list gets brought home. And she's always very cheerful when she comes to the car. And I'm like, honey, do you have your spelling? Oh, no. I'm like, OK, honey, we got to go get it. OK, Daddy. And she runs in, and she runs back. One day, she came running back. She got in the car, and I said, you got it all? And she said, yeah, Daddy. And then she looked and said, oh, I just got the answer sheet. I forgot the spelling list. And I'm going, oh, my god. And she's like, I'll be right back. And she runs in, says hi to the teacher, comes running back, happy as can be. It doesn't really bother her, which is a little concerning. Um, but I don't know if we're going to be there. So you are pushing independence as much as possible and control. All right, now we're going to get into my story. And I've got the experience, emotions, mess yourself, result. Again, it's Missouri, Midwest, whole word language, public uh, school. I mentioned sort of my different aspects, positives, and weaknesses. Uh, and I like the poet this morning, his poem about the story is still unfinished. So I'm going to take this. I'll take this right up to today. And I just had an experience the last I had one today that was rather embarrassing after the first talk when I realized that I put the word wrong word in the PowerPoint. I'll tell you about it when we get to it. Um, it's still unfolding for me, right? But I'll just talk about my experiences, and then you can kind of extrapolate. So my mom tells me. I don't have a lot of memories of it, but she said, you know, I used to read to you a lot when you were little, and your sisters did, too. I had two little sisters. And I, I suppose I had some pleasure connection with reading. Uh, then I started first grade. I loved kindergarten. I had Miss Barry, who was probably 21, and I was in love with her. And I used to try to take nap time next to her desk. <laughs> and I would lay there, and during nap time, I would just stare at her the whole time. I just loved kindergarten. Then I got to first grade, and about the second week of school, the teacher said, OK, children, we're going to have reading groups. And she read some, about 20% of the kids' names. And she said, uh, you kids are going to be the uh, monkey reading group. And they're like, yay, right? Now, it's about 20%. Which kids do you think those are? They're the fast readers, or the exceptional readers, the really good readers, OK? Proficient kids. Then she read about 2 thirds of the class. And she said, you kids are the giraffes. And they were like, yay. Now, she hadn't called me yet, and like two other boys. And I'm sitting there, and I remember thinking, I have this clear memory of me thinking, wolves, 
I want to be a wolf. I hope we're in the wolf group, because wolves are cool, and they could eat those other animals, so we're cooler, right? And all of a sudden she said, and the following students will be in the turtle reading group. And in that moment, while I couldn't read very well, I was smart enough to know what that meant. And it just went poof. That pleasure connection just instantly evaporated. It, it, it was totally gone. The feelings, so that's my experience. Absolutely deflated, you know, like a gut punch. They talk about when you hear something, you just, when she showed, the Dr. Wolf showed that slide of Hemingway's short, short story. What was it, what was it? Uh, children's shoes for sale, never used. You're like, oh, that's how I felt, being in the turtle group. When Alex, he did the PowerPoint for me, he wrote the other day, he wrote, this sucks. And I'm like, honey, we didn't say that word back in the 60s. <laughs> uh, they didn't, nobody said that, it was this stinks. So, this stinks, and the other part, and one of the uh, participants, who's at the principal at St. Anne's, was here earlier, and she talked about her placement in the math group, and how she realized she was never getting out of that group. Now, they didn't have names for it, but the kids always know, when you're in one of the separate groups, do you know that you're behind? You do. Um, I really felt no hope that I would, there was nobody was graduating out of the turtle group. That, there was, that was not happening, and I knew that right away. And so at that point, I'm feeling pretty bad. My message is to self. This first one's really important. Reading is stupid. Now, what other choice did I have? If reading's not stupid, I'm stupid. The Dr. Wolf talked about that. I didn't go down that path, and I don't know why. I think I must have had enough positives built up in me from kindergarten, Miss Barry, and my family that I didn't go down that path. A lot of kids do. They go, down, I must be stupid because I'm behind. I came up with reading is stupid. Now, to me, that's probably a better thing than feeling you're stupid, okay? I further rationalized this all. So you think about Freudian defense mechanisms. I came up with a pretty clear idea that reading was for girls or bookworm boys, okay? Now, where I grew up, being a boy and being called a bookworm was not a compliment. Uh, that meant trouble at the recess playground, okay? So I just decided, well, girls read. Boys don't read, girls read. That, that's just normal. Also, that real boys, we play football and army. We didn't have much homework back then. There, we weren't, public schools, no schools were obsessed with homework the way they are now. So I don't remember a lot of homework. When you got home, you played. Well, I played football and army. We didn't have summer reading books. There was no required reading. There wasn't a requirement about 15 minutes a night like all the children have now. Now my dear mother would, would ask quite frequently, uh, honey, would you like to read a book? My response, uh, no. And why would I do that? That's what girls do, mom, right? So all summer long, it was joyous to me not to have to read. If I did read in the summer, anybody wanna guess what it was? Comic books, Archie. Archie comic, and Richie Rich, I remember Richie Rich and Archie, and that's what I read. I do comic, and Mad Magazine, that was a classic. Uh, that's about all I would read. Everything else, that's not gonna happen, boys don't do that. The result, my early pl pleasure connection is lost. Evaporated at that point. Next experience, this is sort of first, second, third grade. SRA readers and various reminders. How many of you are old enough to remember SRA readers, okay? Now, do you remember what they look like? You'd have a whole bookshelf, right? And they're color-coded, and they have numbers, one through like 20, right? And when the teacher said, okay, children, get your SRA readers, there's always those kids that are getting number 18, 19. What am I getting? Two, right? I was always behind. I can remember seeing the other kids. They're picking up the higher readers, and I'm stuck here on number two, okay? Um, early on, you get the kid who, in the class, reads, they finish, and what do they do? They say, I'm done, okay, with great joy. Now, are they intentionally bragging? No, but if you had a kid, if you're a PE teacher, and that one of the kids finishes the lap first, and they go, I'm first, what do you usually say to them? Knock it off, we don't brag here. That's gonna hurt somebody's feelings, right? Well, that, that hurt my feelings when another kid's going, I'm done, and I'm looking at going, I'm missing recess again. 
I'll be in from recess because I, I, I'm not even halfway, right? Uh, when you're little and kids talk about the kind of books they're reading, first the kids will be, you know, like, well, my, my books don't have many pictures. And then the kid who's even a better reader, they say, well, I'm reading chapter books, right? Now, how many of you love it when a kid says, I'm reading chapter books? Your teacher's like, oh, that's great. Well, I'm reading Dick and Jane. I don't know if any of you remember Dick and Jane. Mm -hmm. It was pretty basic stuff, right? And I really got tired of Dick and Jane. I just wanted them to go away. But the other kids are doing the chapter books, and I'm not. And, and those things, when I talk to the students at St. Anne's, I always remind them. And starting in kindergarten, I teach. And we do phonics, and I read Dr. Seuss, and I mess it up because Dr. Seuss is really hard for me to figure out. And I talk about how all kids re learn to read and phonics and how we, we should never brag about our reading. We should always think about the kid next to us, okay? But that doesn't happen a lot in the classroom. When you are special, exceptional in some way, you're pretty much constantly reminded of it. You, you know it. The other kids know it. We'll talk about the red, mark, the red pen a little later. But so it's these constant reminders so emotionally, I'm feeling defeated. I'm also feeling vulnerable because as I went further in school, they started doing that thing with, okay, uh, would you please stand up and read out loud, right? Now, as a dyslexic reader, what am I feeling the entire class when it came to reading class? I'm terrorized, I am completely vulnerable. And instead of focusing on the subject, I'm just panicked. Now, this was before the days. Now, we could say, it's Gary, right? And I could say, well, tell you what, Gary. I could just even point to the chapter he's going to read. Nobody has to see it. Then he knows when it's his turn, he's reading that chapter. What can he do? He can read ahead. He can practice. Well, that's fine. Then hopefully he can focus on the class. I wasn't getting the story because I'm thinking, I, I'm pretty vulnerable here. This could be embarrassing. Message to self, I can't read never read out loud, and why would anyone read for fun? I just, I had no concept that reading was fun. That, that did not exist for me. Um, avoidance. So my strategy with this one is avoidance. The two most common you'll see with kids is avoidance or opposition, okay? I, I wonder sometimes, you know, there's the, what's the cool hand Luke, where, you know, Luke is gonna defy the man, right? And, and maybe one day I should have just stood up in my chair and said, reading, let's rebel. That probably wouldn't work so well. And I had this kid, Travis, 15 years ago. He was a big kid, he was a fifth grader. And he would do the oppositional thing. And one day at school, teacher put the quiz on his desk. Travis picked it up, looked at her, and crumpled it up, and threw it on the floor. And he's a big guy. Travis said, go to the principal's office. He wouldn't go. Assistant principal comes in. They have to drag him out. About two weeks later, he was in a day treatment program. Travis was dyslexic. He didn't want to read out loud. How embarrassing. His was to be oppositional. I took more of the avoidant path. But those are the two most common you're going to see. Some kids will just fight you because it's embarrassing, right? And it's humiliating. Um, when the bookmobile came, I don't know if any of you know what the bookmobile was. Back in the day, it was a yellow school bus filled with books. And once a week, we'd get on the bus out there parked in front of the school, and you could pick out books. When I did it, I always found the shortest books with lots of pictures. That's what I was going to pick. And really, the other result was decreased effort. So my effort as I went through those early years continued to go down. Book reports, third grade, Swiss Family Robinson. This has an interesting twist about what I learned in the end result. Basically, when we started doing the book reports, my emotions instantly fear that we would have one. You never knew how many reports we were going to have that year, right? And, and you're like, at the start of the year, are we going to have book reports? And the teacher announces we're going to be doing them every month. And I'm like, oh, God. Um, hopeless that I could ever read it all and extremely frustrated. Message to self, I'll never be able to read it. There's no way I'm going to be able to read Swiss Family Robinson in the two weeks. So I came up with some methods. The first, I would avoid it. For the first 12 days when my mother said, well, do you want to get started in Swiss Family Robinson? What would I say? No. Nope. Out the door I went. I can remember, they're always due on Monday, 
And we had a big family, there were seven of us in the family, and, and the basement was the only quiet place in the house. And I would go down on like Saturday with my book, and I would try to read the whole thing on a Saturday. Now, is it really possible for me to do that? No. So I came up with a strategy to get by. I read the first sentence of each page. And that's how I read Swiss Family Robinson. I just read the first sentence of every page. There were a few pictures, I recall, and I passed. I got a C. How did I feel about my C? That's cool. I'm good with a C, right? C means what? At least I'm average. I'm not getting a D, okay? Nowadays, especially at some of the schools, if you send home a C, there's an earthquake, and the parents are showing up going, why did you give him a C, right? Now, the kid's probably like, well, that's fine with me. But, but C's have become taboo. But I could get by just by doing that. I also really developed, I'm, I'm a pretty lazy reader. I, I am still what you would call a lazy reader. I do a lot of skimming. If I want to remember something or really understand it, comprehend it, I have to read it twice. If I really want to remember it, I probably have to read it three times. Uh, first time, I'm just sort of going through it. Now, I love, I read the Wall Street Journal every day. The left side, it's got the little boxes, three sentence summaries of the stories. I love that. That is designed for me. I can just read three sentences. Even with that, if I, I'm like, now what was that about? I, and I have to reread it for my comprehension. I got to reread it um, to get it. If I want to remember it, it's three times. So I, I really became a pretty lazy re reader. Next experience is a positive one for those book reports. So I'd be down in that basement on Saturday trying to read, and my dear mother would bring down homemade chocolate chip cookies and milk to make it a little better for me, right? So what I felt when that happened, I felt comforted by the chocolate chip cookies, and she made the best cookies. She was the favorite room mom. The kids liked her cookies better than all the other kids, so when she was room mom, everybody was happy. So it was incredibly comforting for me. Uh, I also felt understood. So I felt like my mom gets it. She didn't know what dyslexia was. We didn't have tutoring, testing, all this stuff. They, she was just told I'm a slow reader, right? That, that, that's who I am. Um, I was kind of slow. Apparently, Clint Eastwood's mother, you know Clint Eastwood? Clint Eastwood's mother was told, well, he, he's just a slow kid. And he said later, I, I read a quote, and he said, well, I, I guess I just got a late start. That's why I'm still going at 85 or whatever, right? Uh, so he had learning issues too. But I, I loved the, the fact that my mom understood me. Now later, I'll tell you about when my dad understood me. Now if you got your parents both understand how hard it is for you and your teacher does, that's a trifecta. That, that's the lottery ticket right there. And so I got that instant understanding. Message to myself. If you feel good, it makes reading tolerable, okay? So if you design it right, you can get through it. At the end, I'll tell you about my office now. I have this amazing reading center. It is just incredible. And it, as soon as I get in it, I just feel good. If you feel good, you read more. That, that helps with that pleasure connection. Result, I can gut it out. I can get by, okay? So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm through third grade now here. I can probably get by. Uh, at the end of third grade, I did get my first D, which I was very afraid of. It was in handwriting. I'm also dysgraphic, which actually sort of helps when I'm working with uh, dyslexic kids because I'm writing stuff down for them a lot, little tips or this is what you should do, and I write it down on my little yellow notepad form. When I hand it to them, instead of saying, read that back to me, I say, oh, can you read my handwriting? And then if they really can't read my handwriting or they can't read it, period, because they're dyslexic, I'll say, oh, don't worry, I, nobody can read my handwriting either, and I read it back to them, right? And so that, that's a T right there, see that? Um, but I got a D in, in handwriting, and I was extremely afraid. It was a Saturday. You, the old days, you, they give you a report card. You take it home with you, and I must have gotten it on Friday. Remember, it was a Saturday. I took it to my mother first. Why? She was understanding, and she didn't have the belt. Now, I grew up in the traditional German family where Dad had a belt, and he, uh, in, education was really emphasized. That, and I was just like, oh, no, I'm, I'm in big trouble with my dad. Um, he was taking a nap. My mother said, you have to go show your father. And I took it there, and he was, I remember like yesterday, he's in the bed taking a nap, and I handed it to him, and he looks at it, and he says, hand me that pad of paper and that pen over there. I gave it to him. He wrote something. He said, can you read that? I said, no, sir. He said, that's my signature. Nobody can read my handwriting either. Don't worry about it. Someday you'll hire a secretary. 
And I was like, Whew. Now, with that statement, so I had the fear. Now I feel understanding from my dad. He had the same problem. I got it from him. You couldn't, my dad's handwriting is worse than mine, I think. Um, and a great sense of relief. My message, my dad gets it. You don't have to be good at everything. I know if I had come home with a D in math, with a comment from the teacher that I was being silly in class, that would have been a problem. But with handwriting, he's just like, just try your best. Don't worry about it, just try your best. Focus on the important stuff. Those were really helpful lessons for me early on. And there are some times when I can't read my own handwriting. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> like I write something, I'm like, what is that? I can't even tell. Um, result, focus on the bigger stuff. So my efforts, as we'll see shortly, really got focused in math. Experience, um, similes. Now this is funny. So in addition to struggling with reading, the thought of grammar was, and spelling just tweaked my mind out, okay? And I don't, I, I don't know what adjectives are anymore. I, I don't, I know, when Dr. Wolf was talking about stuff, I just, my eyes glazed over. I'm like, I don't even know what she's talking about. I have no idea of the building blocks of language, of English anyway. Uh, I do remember similes. Now the funny part is, Alex, you didn't even know this, when we made the slide, uh, he typed it, I wrote it, I wrote synonyms. And then Dr. T, the St. Anne's principal, afterwards she came up and she said, Actually, those are similes. I'm like, oops, I forgot that one. So <laughs> similes was the one part of grammar. So my mistakes just happened today. Um, it was one part of grammar, I remember, because in third grade, Miss Hunter, again, probably 22 or 23, beautiful brunette who I had a crush on, she said, well, class, for instance, I could, we should talk about similes, she said, I could say that Craig's eyes are as blue as the ocean. And I was like, oh. So right now, I'm feeling incredibly special. The message to myself is, I want to marry her. <laughs> and I remember we had read that Contiki book. It was real popular back then, the guy that made the raft out of bamboo or something and sailed to Hawaii, remember this? And I thought, me and her, we're going to get on the Contiki, we're going to float to Tahiti, and I'm going to marry her. We'll be together forever. I just loved her. Now we'll see, I changed it to similes. I don't think I changed this one. We'll see if it says cinnamons. No, I did it. No. My message and my result was, in my thinking, well, similes are okay. The rest of grammar, not so much. But similes, I can handle similes. I don't mind similes. Unfortunately, I didn't generalize it to the rest of grammar, right? That, that really didn't cross my mind that I would do that. Another experience early on, it was my math speed. I was the fastest math student majority of the time. There's a couple other kids. We were the, always bailing it out to see who could finish the math stuff up. And I loved going up to the board in math class. You know, some of you probably dread it, the math time, right? Remember the chalk at the board? I just love that. I had my hand up. I'm ready to go. So I had good math speed, math knowledge. I felt competence, a lot of pride. Message to myself, I know I'm not dumb, right? That, that's a good message, right? A lot of kids with dyslexic really think they're dumb. Um, math is my thing. Result, extra effort for math. Now at this point in my life, third grade, my effort in reading is going, my effort in math is going, right? So at least I got the math. At least it's all not tanking. But the reading effort just continued to spiral. Fourth grade, it took a pretty dangerous turn. Uh, just quickly about my fourth grade teacher, I just call her now and I, I wrote a book, a chapter in a book, it's downstairs. Uh, it's uh, NPR education editor wrote a book on different, uh, different exceptionalities and she asked me to write one about dyslexia and what I do with kids. And I said, I tell you what, I'll, I'll write my story. And uh, I talk about her and we used to call her Old Lady Smith. Uh, she was older, um, she was a German woman, about six foot tall with just meat cleaver hands, and she was big, and carried around that ruler, right? Now, as kids, as a way to survive, so this is sort of prisoner humor, you have to survive with that, and we just would joke about old Lady Smith, right? we make fun of her, we might draw little pictures of her, right? That actually helped us get by. Um, now that I think about it, when we, we talk about chronic stress, I had it, I, and in retrospect, I'm like, whoa, I, I really was, 
tremendously stressed in that class. And she would come around when the ruler sometimes. So if you're one of those kids with attentional issues and you're daydreaming, she'd come by and just wham on your desk and you would like spring back to life, right? And you're like, oh God. So we got her walking around. And then the other thing she relished was her red pen. And not only would she correct our papers with that, but she would walk around during class if we're doing a writing assignment, looking and would circle it right on your paper as you're working. How does that feel for a dyslexic? Now, I would tell, for anybody, and I would tell you, switch to blue or green. Those work fine. You can edit with blue or green, right? Red, in nature, what does red mean? Warning, danger, poison. That's what it felt like to get the red pen. Now, my mother in college, I forget to mention this, the first one in college, I'd write home sometimes, back before cell phones on. We'd call on Sundays for 10 minutes when the rates were low, and we'd send a letter every now and then. And I'd send a letter home once a month. My dear mother would write back her letter to respond, but then she would also include my letter in it with all the mistakes circled in red. And I'm like, Mom, this is not getting me to write home more. I don't really want to write home if you're going to circle all my mistakes and send it back. But she felt compelled to try to teach me, even in college, about grammar and spelling. So we got the red pen, failure. Nothing highlights your failures like red ink. When you pass this stuff out in the classroom, do the kids notice? Yeah. They know what other kids get. They, they see it. And if you've got a bunch of red on there, that's pretty humiliating. Message yourself, I can't spell or do grammar either. All right? Result, I really wanted to rush through it. I, I would just, how many of you got kids that just rush through it? fast as they can. And if you say to them, I'd like you to proofread it, what do they say? Well, that's not happening. That's World War III at home. Mm -hmm. Now in my mind, and this is what you have to remember, it wasn't that I didn't want to correct any mistakes I could find. So I will proofread my stuff now, and occasionally I'll notice something that I know that I did wrong, okay? But in my case, I was like, well, what's the point of it? Because I don't know what's wrong. I just wrote something. Maybe I missed a period. That I knew. But the other 10 things, I don't even know. So how am I supposed to know? Does that make sense? You can't proofread if you don't know how to do it. Proofreading is for careless mistakes. That's what it's for. Not when you truly don't know it. And, and so I, I constantly just, why should I even do this? And even now when I'm writing the other day, I try to find a word, unconscionable, I didn't know how to spell. I put it in my, I did the word search, you know, on, on the computer. It popped up some other words. Wasn't it? Popped up more words. Finally, I came up with a new word. I am the master at finding a shorter word to describe something if I can't figure out to spell it. And if spell check doesn't even work, I just come up with a new word, right? Uh, I know now they'll, they'll like count the number of syllables in your sentence or something, like in each word, how long the monosyllabic, I can't even say the word. How many syllables you are? I'm the king of one syllable words. That, that really got me by. It's just figuring out the quickest, shortest word. Experience, fourth grade, continuing. I dared one day to go up and ask old lady Smith, and I said, how do you spell blank? And with her big arms and bony fingers, she pointed at a pedestal right by the door. And we all knew what was on that pedestal, the hardbound Oxford Dictionary, this thick. And I'm thinking, a book that has its own piece of furniture? Is it really that important? I mean, the Bible and the, the dictionary, what else has their own furniture, right? And she said, go look it up. And I can remember standing there all through recess just crying because I couldn't figure out the first word, the letter, the first letter. I didn't know what it started with. And I'm like, I'll never find it. There's a lot of words in here. And, and when I wrote about it, I wrote, it's like trying to find a sardine in an ocean full of fish. How do you do that? And I just, all I remember is the other kids came back from recess, and she's like, well, just go sit down, all right? That, that year was, was really just chronic stress. It was chronically feeling I'm going to get attacked in some way. So I'm feeling hopeless, pretty depressed about school. By the end of fourth grade, one, I thought, in terms of learning to read at that point, there's really no point. There's no hope for me. Uh, and I really started to hate school. Other results, 
fear of reading and writing. That red pen, I'd love to write now. That red pen sucks the joy out of my writing. Who wants to write if somebody's gonna be corrected and all like that? And, and I actually can write pretty creatively. I like to put thoughts into words. But I just don't do the grammar and spelling. And, and so that really took a toll on the writing. And dread of the new year, I was one of those kids that I relished and looked forward to summer and I had the greatest summers. In Missouri, you could have fireworks. And we'd spend all of June building models and all of July blowing them up. <laughs> and it was just pure heaven, running around the neighborhood, playing baseball and fishing and all that. And then the school year started. And it always started the day after Labor Day. And back then, there was this thing called the Jerry Lewis Telethon. And it was like three days. And I would sit in the basement, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, watching the telethon and just going, school's coming and just dreading it, and always knowing the first day of school, guess what we'd have to do? Let, write a paper about what you did over the summer. And it was just, I absolutely dreaded the school year, absolutely hated it. Um, now, fifth grade, things really dramatically changed for me. I had my first male teacher, Mr. Underwood. He was in the science, he also flew uh, remote control airplanes. That was cool. Loved math, he loved teaching us about the jet airplane. I'm excited. I'm finally stimulated to learn. Started to feel a little bit more hopeful and a little risky, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Uh, ris risky around reading. I determined uh, maybe school is okay. Maybe I can learn by reading. And you can get some kind of cool stuff out of reading. You could actually learn cool stuff. That never really had dawned on me before until Mr. Underwood. I increased my overall effort. My reading, you know, my effort at reading started to pick up with him. My very first risk at reading a book, the first two books I ever read, other than ones we were told to, that actually read cover to cover. First one was uh, Instant Replay, which is a story of Jerry Kramer, who was the right guard football player for the Green Bay Packers in 1968, uh, and Bart Starr, they were in the Ice Bowl. It's this really famous football game against the Dallas Cowboys to get into the Super Bowl, and Bart Starr, the famous quarterback, did a quarterback sneak behind Jerry Kramer into the end zone on this frozen field. And his book was all about his life with Bart Starr, Vince Lombardi, the coach, and I was amazed. I was like, this is so cool. So it was about this thick, and I have them. I still have them. The second one is um, From Ghetto to Glory, which is the story of Bob Gibson, who was a Hall of Fame pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals back in 67, 68. I actually got to see him uh, pitch in the World Series in third grade. And he grew up in a ghetto in St. Louis and went on to become this incredible baseball pitcher, um, Will Hall of Fame pitcher. And I read those two books. And that's the first risk I took with reading. Again here, find something you like. Nowadays, what do you call that? Choice reading? You all do choice reading, right? You let the kids pick? Choice reading is a good thing. That works for people like me. In the middle school, we've got some mixed experience. I went to the one of the first public middle schools in the country. It was like 68, as I recall. I have to think about that. Uh, but where they had the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Before that, it was all the traditional K through 8, or you had the junior highs, which were 7, 8, 9. And this was one of the first to have, and it was a brand new building. 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade. Got into there, and emotionally, I had a ton of excitement about the options. We had boys home ec, we had shop class, we had a swimming pool. I played on the water polo team. I played on the hockey team. They had a floor hockey team. Wrestling, I did the wrestling. Um, the shop, the science, we had a science lab, you know, with the beakers and everything. It was top of the line. It was the state-of-the-art education. And so for me, there were all these other ways that I could feel successful. That idea of mastering, all of a sudden I've got new ways to do it. There are so many other things I can do, is the message, except language arts, which still stinks. <laughs> and, now, one of that, I had a lot of fun. Um, I did learn how to gut out LA Lit. I just kind of got through it. By about fifth grade, because of my whole language memory ability, my reading got faster. Because I, unless it was a new word that I had to use phonics, I was toast. But my general reading got faster because I had collected so many words and stored them in memory. So I'd seen them enough that I started to pick up with speed. Um, I still didn't want to know the rules of grammar. Now, my dear wife, when she corrects something for me, she often feels compelled to try to explain why she made the correction she did and what the rule is. She's a school teacher, right? And I just say, honey, I, I don't want to know the rule. I just want you to fix it for me. And it's like when I go to the Verizon store with my phone when it's not working. 
And these young kids, they always feel compelled to try to explain it to you what to do. And I'm like, no, I, I don't want to know what to do. I just want you to do it for me. I don't want to learn about phones. I just want you to do it for me. And that's the same I got to with grammar. Um, seventh grade Sunday school. Does it matter? Do we go till 2.15? Is that correct? You an hour and 15 minutes? Is that about right? OK. Ten. I'm going to correct. I'm going to, well, we start a couple minutes late. So you won't mind. Philippe won't mind. Seventh grade Sunday school, mixed class, boys and girls. Teacher asked me to read out of the Bible. The king's name, now I know, is Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I tried to read that. It didn't go so well. Now, in the Bible, it says God didn't like King Nebuchadnezzar, and I determined he didn't like him for having such a bad name. Like, who would have that name that you couldn't say it? Well, I butchered it, and this kid, Zach Richardson, looked up, and he said in a whispering voice, but loud enough for the other kids to hear, what are you, a dumbass? And I went home that day from Sunday school, and I said to my mom, I am never going back. I'm not going back to that class. And my mom said, look, I'll give you two choices. I can go talk to the teacher and ask her to not have you read out loud anymore, okay? Today we'd call that an accommodation, right? Or she said, you can go teach the kindergarten classroom in the Sunday school. You can help in the kindergarten class. She said, it's not an option for you to stay home. You need to be at church at Sunday school. What do you think I chose? The kids. And I'm still working with, that was the first time I worked with kids. It was seventh grade. I started working with the kids, and I just loved it. Had a great time. Now, emotionally, Total humiliation. Does a seventh grade guy want to be embarrassed in front of the girls? No. Oh, that's a tough one. That's brutal. But I felt understood again, that my mom got it, right? That she was willing to go talk to the teacher. Message itself, I hated that kid. The rest of middle school, he was at my church group. Couldn't stand him, wanted to just hit him. Didn't like the teacher anymore, either. Uh, but then I realized accommodations do exist. They didn't call them that, but there are other ways to do stuff. Results, um, avoid actions that increase your risk. Now, they thought for years that dyslexic kids were less social than other kids because people noticed they weren't attending various things. When they did the research, they found they're just as social as other kids, but they avoid formal social things. So they'll play in the neighborhood, they'll run the neighborhood, but they'll tend to avoid the scout groups or the Sunday schools because why? Somebody might ask you to read. So, so you avoid those situations. Now, I also learned about a year ago when I took my daughter early for mass. She sings in the, the church choir over at MPB, and the kids' choir, and they were going to sing. She had to be there a half hour early. And I learned, don't ever go to mass early, because as I'm sitting there, the priest comes up and says, would you like to read from the gospel? And I'm like, <laughs> no, thank you. Like, I'm never coming early again. Um, and learning to help kids, and I've been doing the kids ever since. Experience, um, symbolism, and transitioning to high school. Somewhere around eighth or ninth grade, we read Animal Farm. And I remember the teacher talking about how this was representational of, of the Soviet Union and communism. And I'm like, it's a talking pig <laughs> and a farmer and talking animals is not about communism. Now for me, I'm capable of analytical thinking, uh, abstract thinking, symbolism. But because I had to so focus on the words, what does that not allow me to do? to think deeply. So you gotta remember your kids that are struggling, they're just trying to read the words. They're not gonna come up with big concepts because they're so bogged down in the words. Uh, the other one, any middle schooler, so boys are behind anyway, if you ask a, like a seventh grade girl to write a story about what did the flower represent, she's gonna write about internal flowering and femininity and beauty and love. If you ask a seventh grade boy, they're gonna write, it's a rose, it's red, it has thorns. Right? We're a little more basic when it comes to doing the symbolism. I went to a traditional Lutheran high school. First couple of years, very bogged down. Traditional, you know, math, reading, science, lots of grammar, lots of spelling. Even in history class, if you spelled it wrong, it was coming back. You got points off. Um, bogged down trying to read. Really just discuss with the whole f grammar stuff. The message itself was pretty much just stupid. I, I was a, a C student through high school. I was a total slacker. I had a lot of fun with my friends. I really didn't give a, I don't want to say the phrase, inappropriate. I filtered it, but I didn't really care very much about it. And C's were good enough. You know, to me, C's would be okay, uh, being a slapper, except math. And I got put ahead a year in math. So that was really cool, being with the older kids. Uh, as a freshman, I'm with the sophomores, and. 
That was delightful. Um, Civil War class, junior year, junior year, Dr. Prowl, first teacher I ever had, that when you wrote a paper on the causes of the Civil War, what's the only thing he graded? Your ideas on what you could theorize about the Civil War. I absolutely came alive in his class. It was the first time I ever had somebody not take off from my grammar and my spelling and sentence structure. He just wanted to know my ideas. And it was the first time I got an A in his class. I actually, at his retirement as a Lutheran school teacher, I got to, to talk about him, and he just was in tears. Um, I'm going to tear up. He changed my life. Dr. Prado changed, completely changed my academic trajectory. After his class, I, I went from C's to, I had a 3.98 in college, undergrad, and all A's through two graduate degrees. I never stopped after his class. Now, as you get up, do people care as much about grammar and stuff? No, you're, you're moving up in the world. Liberated, pride, message to self. For the first time in my life, I felt like a student. There's a big difference between a kid going to school and a student. A student has pride. They feel like they can do it, they can master it. They're, they're involved in their education. A slacker going to school is not involved in education, and I was one of those kids. But now, I'm a student. I can write. It's my ideas account. Who cares about spelling? Results, increased effort, hopeful for college. My grade point average was not high enough to get me. I went to Valparaiso University, a liberal arts college in Indiana. I wouldn't have gotten in there on my grade point average, but the uh, pastor at my church had been the former dean of the chapel, <laughs> and he loved me. I was the janitor at the church, and he wrote me a letter, and I got in. Uh, and thankfully, I did very well there and realized it's all about maximizing your strengths. So I'd like to talk to kids. Minimize your weaknesses, maximize your strengths. College and graduate school, it just kept going. Just kept rolling with it. Hopeful, proud, determined. The message to self. You just have to jump through the grammar hoops. We all have to do that. April 15th, what hoop do we all have to jump through? The taxes. Now, you may really stink at math. Too bad, so sad. Guess what? You got to do it. Or you get somebody to do it for you, like your husband or your boyfriend, right? I learned uh, to just find the right people. My roommate, uh, the next door, the apartment next to mine in my first year of graduate school, she was a PhD in English major. And she would do all my grammar and spelling. It was just heaven to have her next door. And get to the main point, I loved alternative testing assessments. I loved tutorials. So teachers that would let you study the topic and then come talk with them and just verbally talk and debate for two hours. Those were the bomb. I went to Cambridge for a while in England, and I actually have a tutorial robe. I, I kept mine and wore it at graduation at college. It's a black robe like Harry Potter. And you put your suit on, you put your robe on, you walk across campus, you'd meet with a professor for two hours, debate, and he would tell you if you passed or not. And I absolutely love that. Other alternatives to testing, really no looking back, relying on others like my roommate. The other thing I've really learned to do well, and it fits with my speed, is I, I can figure out how to find out what's important. Alex is the same way. He doesn't read it all. He just can figure out, well, where's the important stuff? I love yellow highlighters. Yellow highlighters are great. Every kid should own their textbooks, especially exceptional kids, so they can use a highlighter and figure it out. It, it really helped me get to it, point, figure out the point really quick. Um, experience, I read my first novel when I was 30 years old with my fiance. It was The Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy. I had never read a novel before, uh, ever. I was 30 years old. I, I read, read most of it on her lap while laying there uh, at, at Cherry Creek Reservoir or something. And what I remember after reading, it was this thick. I was so proud of myself that I could read a book that thick. But I remember the first time going, it's like having a movie in your head. I had never had that idea for 30 years of my life that it's like a movie. And sometimes the book's better than the movie, right? Um, it, absolutely phenomenal. And I've read several books since then. Fascinating, absolute disbelief. Reading can be amazing. Don't let details stop you. Dr. Wolf said, you do not have to be a perfect reader. All you have to be able to do is get the information you need out of it. When I was a kid, it was focused on those details of reading, and I couldn't do it. Now, fortunately, I learned how to get the, the bigger stuff out. Finally, at age 30, a pleasure connection. So whatever I had at five, it came back at 30. Next slide. Dr. Seuss, Harry Potter, and the Bible, the three books I don't like to read out loud. When Alex was four in preschool, I'd go read to the children every week, and sometimes he'd say, read Dr. Seuss, and I'd be like, 
really? Dr. Seuss? <laughs> do we have to do Dr. Seuss? Um, there's a few Dr. Seuss words that I've had teachers can't tell me how to say it. And then, then I always feel vi victriolic. Even the teacher can't do that word. And I'm like, yes, I'm not so dumb after all. Harry Potter, when I read it, I read the first two, two I'm on page 16 of chapter three, the third one, for like the last 10 years. But that girl's name, Hermione. Hermione. When I was reading it, I just thought, I'm going to call her Sue. So I read the whole Harry Potter, two books, with, I replaced Sue. Then when he was on his birthday, we saw the first movie, you know, like nine or eight, and it was Hermione. I could hear it, right? Uh, and the Bible. That my, what's that? I didn't know how to pronounce that either. Yeah, <laughs> most people. That's a tough one. <laughs> the Bible, I already told you that story. I did have to read in a church. I preach at churches. And um, I have a Master of Divinity as well as Master of Social Work. And they asked me to read the gospel lesson. I'm like, um, do I have to? He's like, well, we don't have anybody else to do it. I'm like, okay. And the first sentence was, Jesus went to the lake of blah, blah. And I looked at that and I thought, I don't know how to say the name of that lake. So I'm in front of the whole congregation. And I just said, so Jesus went to the lake. I didn't mention the name. <laughs> I just filtered out the name of the lake. Um, emotions, I still have some hesitations now and then. There's old wounds will resurface now and then. But overall, it's just have fun, laugh at myself. And if you do that, you can really make great connections with struggling kids, right? A lot of the DA faculty are kids who struggle too. They get our kids because they struggled, right? And when you've done that, you really have this unique relationship with them. They feel understood and appreciated. Um, words test substitution and uh, declining memory. I, I, as a reader now, I, and I frequently will do this, sometimes I do it when I talk, I pick a word that sounds like the word I want, and because my way of doing it is whole word, there's just this massive storage area of words. And sometimes a word will sound like the word I want, and I say the wrong word. Uh, there's Bushisms 1 and 2. Have you ever seen the Bushisms book? They're about first Bush, second Bush, who I'm sure dyslexic. I've never heard them say it. But they do that. And they have all the things they said as presidents that where they use the wrong word. And some of them are hysterical. I mean, they're absolutely outrageous, the word they would use. But it sounded like. Uh, the other one, when I do, because it's whole brain, if I see a word that looks like another, the configuration of the letters, I'll mix it up. So a couple weeks ago, my daughter's selling Girl Scout cookies. They have the new gluten-free one called Toffee, Toffee-tastic. Well, I was, we were on her first sale, and I picked up the box, and I said, oh, and they have this new one, Tofu-tastic. <laughs> and my daughter's like, Dad, that's gross. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, no, toffee. Now think about the word toffee and tofu. Do they sort of look alike if you did it fast? And, and I do that quite frequently. Brain analysis over the last 10 or 15 years, just like here in Dr. Wolf, more and more is coming out about how our brains work. And that really helped me feel understood. So that's what's going on in my brain. And I love to teach the kids at St. Anne's. This is what's going on in the brain of a dyslexic. It's not that big of a mystery. I did learn another thing about myself today when she talked about rhythm, because I was one of those kids, I could never clap on the beat. You know, the whole class, music class, we'd all be clapping, and I'd be the kid that'd be like, <laughs> and everybody like, oops, right? <laughs> little fifth grade, I played drums for about a month. I was in the Christmas program with a little drummer boy. All I had was this little piece, and I screwed it up with the Christmas program in front of everybody. I just can't do rhythm. It's just not there. Um, here, frustration, some humiliation. I don't really care that much anymore. The beauty of getting older is you don't really care anymore. It's like people expect you to not know stuff and forget stuff. Um, <laughs> Self-understanding, that really is helping. I love helping kids understand themselves. Um, I, I just hate doing that. And when Dr. T came and she said, those are similes, not cinnamons. I'm like, oh my God, I did it again. Um, but also, so that's what's wrong. And here, self-acceptance and being open about it and really helping all kids. So I like to teach all kids about reading, and how to be sensitive to your classmates. We'll just wrap up. Fourth grade girl the other day, I'm visiting with her, she said, hey, Mr. Nibberg, I just got my testing results back. And I said, yeah, honey. She said, I have dyslexia. And I said, welcome to the club. And we high-fived each other, and we're, we're dancing, going, woo we're in the club. And her mother comes in going, what's going on? And I say, she's like, mommy, I'm in the club with Mr. Nibberg. And we're like, yeah. So the idea is you got to have fun, right? And even if you're struggling, if you make it fun for kids, will they like it more? Fun understanding, I love to read now. Read two newspapers a day, all kinds of stuff. Helping all re readers, and I met you in my new reading room. Make some final points. Your emotions as parents, do parents feel grief when their kid's struggling? 
Yeah. Do parents get frustrated with homework? Mm -hmm. You betcha, right? And you've got to realize your own grief and you need to talk to somebody, your spouse, your friends, get support for your own emotions. Kids need time to talk about their emotions. The special needs kids, as we just reviewed, I had a lot of emotions. They need to somebody to talk to them about their emotions. How are they handling their feelings? One of your top goals for homework is not completion of the work. It's to help your kid learn to do their homework without losing it and getting frustrated and getting upset and throwing a fit. That process of learning how to feel good about your work is more important than the work itself. So for exceptional kids, you're really focused a lot of time in the classroom. I'm so proud of you. Did you see how you worked out through that one? You, you took a deep breath, you tried it a second time, and you got it. I'm so proud of you. I don't really care about the answer. What do I care about? That she got it without throwing a fit or giving up, right? So they need time to talk about their emotions. They didn't ask to be born dyslexic. Nobody does. Um, Self-concept versus self-esteem. Self-esteem is how you feel about how you see yourself. You, if I measure myself against others reading, how am I going to feel about myself? I'm a failure, right? But if I measure my effort and how much progress I'm ma making compared to myself, how can I feel? Pretty good. And with exceptional kids, you're grading them on their effort for them. And they may not, because the, a lot of times you associate product, the end product with effort. Well, especially these kids, that's not going to happen. You have to really kind of dig in there and realize they're trying as hard as they can. The average dyslexic kid uses twice the energy to read the same amount of material. They're, they're exhausted. You're, you're trying to have, figure out other ways to analyze their effort versus the outcome grade. They're, they're not going to get the answers. But you're emphasizing that and, and the effort piece, that how we do and how we try, and, and progress against yourself. You're measuring them with that. Positive messages. If you want to get uh, kids, struggling kids to really want to change and be different and get motivated, the ideal re ratio in research is 80-20. 80% 80 positive, 20% negative. 80% of what you do with them is positive. Positive reinforcement, only 20% negative. Now, the other night with my daughter with homework on Sunday night after she'd been traveling to the East Coast, was exhausted. I come to the kitchen to get some water or something. My wife says, she's got this to do, this to do, this to do. I'm going to the back room to get on the computer because I can't take it anymore. And I'm like, oh God, now I'm in charge. And I sat down with her and I got my computer right next to her. I'm like, okay, honey, you're starting your project. It was not going well. And I, my temper was, it was starting to go. I was reaching, about to pull a play date from her when I remembered that line. And I looked at her and I said, honey, tell you what, she was doing a state report. And I said, you got about seven, eight questions left. For every question you get done in two minutes, I'll set the kitchen timer. If you get it done in two minutes or write it down, I'll give you a starburst. She got all eight done under the time. She didn't even use the whole 16 minutes. She got eight starbursts. And she was so proud of her sister. She was like, thank you, Daddy. And she gave me a big hug. And I said, no, honey, we're not doing that again. That was a special time because you were out on the East Coast. If you ever go out on the East Coast again on a Sunday night late, maybe we'll do it. I don't want to get in the habit of that. But I had to switch it because I was in a really negative place. And it was going south. Um, don't overdo it. Sometimes take a break from tutoring. If you are tutoring, my daughter goes with one of her friends now for math tutoring. They each do a half hour. We have an hour of homework time together. I sit with the girls, we do homework, we have the tutor come, we do the tutoring, and then they play. That makes tutoring acceptable. She loves, she looks forward to her Tuesday nights, okay? Um, sometimes the homework, homework is ruining families. It is a major buzzkill. Sometimes as parents, I would tell you, you just say, you know what, Gary? We're bagging homework tonight. You have my permission to tell the teacher, we just decided not to do it, and it's okay with me. We're gonna play Uno. We're gonna watch a movie together. You have to save some joy. I had a very fun childhood. I had a lot of fun. I have great memories. Do I wish sometimes I had tutoring? There's a part of me that thinks, yeah, I would've gotten to be a better reader sooner. There's another part of me that's like, not really. I would have had to do more t reading. I would have had to do tutoring and all that stuff. So you just got to take a break from it sometimes. Don't overdo it. Homework structured for the kids, water, exercise, and protein before they start homework. They need that. Then you get to it. Try to throw an element of choice. Give them a couple choices here or there. Um, if you can tie a friend in with homework, that always works, kids. I find both with Alex and my daughter, if we have a friend there doing the homework, it really helps motivate them, makes it a little lighter than just being down there, just buried. 
teach the kids how to take a break. I have this one boy that when he gets frustrated, his mom says, go run a lap. And he runs around the neighborhood, and then he's fine, and then he gets back to work. Um, finally, keeping a long-term developmental perspective. Dr. Wolf said it took 2,000 years for us to develop reading, right? And now we're expecting kids to learn to read in 2,000 days. With special needs kids, exceptional kids, you gotta, you gotta think long term. What you're parenting for, teaching for, is joy, uh, joy of learning, hopefully a pleasure connection with reading. For some kids, that may never happen, but they can still enjoy learning, right? A sense of pride and a sense of independence. Those are the goals you're shooting for. Mr. Underwood helped me with that in fifth grade. Dr. Prowlow, junior in high school, changed my life with that philosophy. And that's the long-term perspective that you want to keep in mind. So with that, I will say happy reading. Enjoy Dr. Wolf again, and thank you for coming. I appreciate it.